Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you who are in Europe. I'm Yuri Tarikomaga, country representative for EuroSAS Japan, and this is the first day of the European Research Days Japan 2022 series. This event series is going to um, last for three days, and it's an annual flagship event of EuroSAS Japan and its partners. This event is basically designed to inform researchers, innovators, practitioners, and professionals across Japan and the world to showcase their research achievements and also to explore collaboration and networking opportunities. We are going to hear from European researchers who work and study in Japan, and they dedicate these presentations to those of you who are hoping to follow them in their career paths. We will also look at how to become effective science communicators and how to change a career path from academia to industry to realize one's potential on the third day. I'm really grateful to our partners for helping us to put this event series online and also to facilitate the hybrid arrangement in the coming days. So I would like to expressly thank the German Academic Exchange Service a regional office Tokyo, the German Center for Research and Innovation Tokyo, the German JSPS Alumni Association, Scienscope, the French Students and Researchers Organization in Japan, the Association of Spanish Researchers in Japan, and the Association of Italian Researchers in Japan. Thank you for all the hard work and um, for collaborating with us on this event. And uh, let me just um, give the opportunity to Tanya Friedrichs, Policy Officer at DG for Research and Innovation, the European Commission, to give her opening speech. Since she could not be with us this morning, which is afternoon in Japan, uh, I would like to ask my colleague to play the video. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you very much, Judith and Araxis, for ha to having me. It's a real pleasure and honor to do the opening of the RNI Days 2022. Since the beginning of the year, I'm working on the cooperation uh, with Japan in DG Research um, and Innovation in, in Brussels, and it's for me a real eye opener to now look at cooperation between the EU and, and Japan, especially since beginning of October, I had the privilege to attend the STS forum and I met all this engaged and committed uh, scientists and other stakeholders and talking and saying that we should increase the international cooperation. And here I have an opportunity already to speak to you, to scientists, innovators, um, industry and actually s doing what we said is that we need to increase international cooperation. It is absolutely necessary to meet the global challenges that we face. This is why also our program Horizon Europe is open to the world, but in particular we privilege cooperation with Japan and other like-minded countries because in this changing world, it is very important that we also cooperate with countries and with regions that do respect fundamental values and rule of law and the key research and innovation principles such as academic freedom, research integrity and ethics, gender equality, open access to data, IPR, and we know that with Japan, we can count on the respect of this principle. And it is why we look more and more also to opening our program with Japan, invite entities from Japan to look at our calls of proposals and also encouraging the Europeans to take on board entities from Japan in consortia. This can be done today on what we would call an ad hoc basis and but in the longer term we would want Japan to be associated uh, to our program and this is why we have started the discussions on association with Japan which would offer 
the same possibilities, opportunities under the um, horizon Europe as the entities have for member states and other associated countries. And that would really give a boost to our cooperation. And that is where, where we would like to come with you on association so that all the programs that are presented, you can at participate in all of the calls, in all of the topics. We don't need to think in advance on which topics. We don't need to think in advance on, on, on which calls. All will be open on an equal footing to participants um, of, of Japan. And you will see that there are many opportunities in Horizon Europe between Europe and, and, and Japan, and especially I saw in the program that you will also have an opportunity to look at this way of going from an academic career to industry. And that is something very inherent to our program Horizon Europe, where we do encourage cooperation, not only multilaterally between different countries, but also multi-stakeholders, because we really do believe that putting academia and industry together in one project will advance the possibility to find solutions to the problems uh, that we face. Because academia have ideas, they can test it with industry and they can come up with practical solutions. And that is something very specific of our program, which I'm very pleased that Araxis has identified as a way of strengthening the cooperation between uh, Europe and uh, Japan as well. There are many opportunities. I let you enjoy the three days and I encourage you really to take advantage of it, to ask all the questions. This is a fantastic opportunity and as Policy Officer for Japan, I hope to see the fruit of that result in very soon when we look at the projects that come out um, of the next work program 2023-2024 and, and I'm sure that I will see many more Japanese entities participating in the cooperation between Europe and um, under Horizon Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya, for the presentation. And uh, I would like to invite our next uh, speaker, uh, Zdenek Leibner, uh, to talk about oval squids as laboratory animals. Uh, he's a research technician at the Physics and Biology Unit at uh, OIS, the um, Okinawa uh, uh, Institute. And um, unfortunately, he couldn't be present um, in real time. So he basically sent us a video recording as well. Um, you can see that um, some of our speakers um, are here with us today. So let's hear the next video and then proceed with the real-time presentations. Hello, I'm Zdeněk and I come from the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology to introduce our ongoing research on oval squids from the Sepioteutis lesoniana species complex. We are culturing oval squids over multiple generations in a flow-through system at the OIST Marine Science Station. And the marine station consists of storages, workshop, and administrative areas. Animals are kept in a large outdoor and indoor area here. Our squids successfully reproduce in both outdoor and indoor area as well. Here you can see our Shiroika laying eggs indoor. People are trying to culture oval squids reportedly since 60s of 20th century. We reached the 10th inbred generation of Shiroika in captivity this year, and we didn't notice any sign of inbreeding depression. In comparison to previous attempts, we keep our squids in higher densities and lower water volumes while preserving a relatively high survival. 
By now, the possible negative effect of inbreeding remains undetected and it seems rather marginal. While keeping conditions are rather improving, as we can guess from the increasing hatching rate. We are also improving the detailed characterization of our inbred strain of genome on genomic and many other levels. Initially, we expected uh, uh, the genome size of our squid below four gigabases, but uh, so it was a little surprise that it's somehow bigger. Our squids are doing just fine on a dead food diet, which simplifies the workflow and allows a further cost reduction. Squid can eat dead fish of their own size, as you can see on this group of subpadels fooling in our production tank. In the marine station, we succeeded also in closing the life cycle of Kuaika, which is the small, smallest member of the Sepiotis dislesonina species complex. And here you can see their mating in our tank. And we are reproducing also Akaika, which is the largest member so, of the Sepiotis lesoniana species complex. Here you can see a pair. They are tru truly majestic animals. Female is showing their uh, nidamental glands on this video. And this video was made just before one day before she laid eggs. These species differ also in numbers of eggs, uh, in their casings, uh, and in their shapes. Shoika has usually three eggs per casing in the marine station, Akaika has usually eight, and Kuaika two. Our progress in squid aquaculture techniques sparked interest uh, mainly in local media, as you can see in this example. SDGs習慣とされていまして、SDGs の推進や達成のための意識を高め、行動を起こすきっかけを作るため、世界中でイベントなどが開催されています。今回はオイストが世界で初めて開発に成功したイカの養殖システムについてです。これまで困難とされていたイカの養殖が事業化できれば将来的に食料不足の解消や海の環境保全につながると注目されています。So this report is quite long and in Japanese, so I will skip skip that. So I will now tell a few words about the behavior of these squids. We conducted a test whether the Shiroika camouflage to substrate while in motion. And as you can see on the right, we recorded a group of squids by top view and side view camera simultaneously. From the top view video, camera record the time and RGB score are recorded at the center of the squid head between front edge of eyes. Within one second after the whole animal crossed the divider, we selected this body area because it is not transparent. The linear mixed model revealed a highly significant interaction between the effect of substrate and all measured RGB color channel values. I am a shared first author of the recent article in scientific reports from March this year. And this article sparked interest mainly in international media like CNN, for example. So this one, I think you can see complete because it's in English. The study that we conducted happened with a little accident. We are keeping many schools at our laboratory and as a daily chores, we clean the tank and feeding, and we observe this peculiar behavior of a squid camouflaging to a substrate. A substrate could be a C4, or in the experimental condition, it's the bottom of the tank. What we did, we cleaned the bottom of the tank, one side to be very clean, so it's a lighter blue color of the tank, 
And the other side was the color was algae, which gives dark green mossy color. With super camera uh, above the tank, as well as inside the tank. And uh, we watched three animals swimming across this boundary. In the side view video, we can see that uh, the cephalopod is actively reacting to the different substrate by expanding its chromatophores. Chromatophores are organs that the cephalopods are using to change their color by expanding the suck with a pigment. The difference is that it's using semi-transparency, parts of its body are, are completely transparent and combines it with pigment-based camouflage and it creates a very different optical effects. It opens a whole new area of research and uh, it can have various applications for development for future optical devices, like for example, invisibility clothes. Combination of all these mentioned characteristics make the oval squids exceptionally good for studies not only of camouflage but also many other interesting phenomena and there are still so many unknowns left. So please let us know if you find our search and squid interesting and we are open for cooperation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Again, thank you Zdenek for the uh, presentation. And those of you who would like to ask him questions, please send us an email to japan at euroxas.net. We are going to relay the questions to Zenek. And those of you who would like to ask questions from um, upcoming uh, uh, presenters, please type your questions in the Q&A box right here in Zoom. And there will be an opportunity to get your queries answered at um, approximately 3.15. We'll see how we do with time. I would like to welcome our next presenter from the same institute, uh, Samira Agmer, and uh, she will talk about DNA-based asymmetric catalysis, a new twist on a very old molecule. She's research um, assistant, a graduate research assistant at uh, OIST, and she'll give you a different perspective on what kind of opportunities there are um, in Okinawa. Samira, if you could please uh, share your slides. All right. Yep. I hope you can see and hear me all right. <laughs> yes, perfect. You're in full screen mode, so please proceed. Thank you so much. OK. Uh, welcome to my quick talk about DNA-based asymmetric catalysis, uh, a new twist on a very old molecule. Uh, I am a part of the Nucleic Acid Chemistry and Engineering Unit, uh, or also the Yokobayashi Lab at OIST. Uh, here you can see our professor on the left, uh, Professor Yohei Yokobayashi. And on the right, you can see our unit. Um, we uh, investigate applications of high throughput sequencing and try to engineer nucleic acid enzymes. Uh, we also develop uh, riboswitches in mammalian cells, viruses, and bacteria. Uh, we also have a chemistry part in this lab where I am uh, currently working in, uh, where DNA-driven self-assembly and DNA-based asymmetric catalysis is of interest. Uh, and we currently have postdoc from a variety of backgrounds uh, in chemistry and life sciences. We also have some bioinformatics. Uh, and in general, it's a very interdisciplinary uh, group. So the way I came to Japan is actually pretty interesting. Uh, 2011, I was at BASF and I wanted to be part in an exchange program uh, that usually does exchanges for young professionals to the US, but I was more interested in going to Japan. Unfortunately, there was no such program established. Uh, so it took about 10 years for me to finally arrive in Japan. 
which was the case in February 2022, uh, where I was at Oyster admissions workshop uh, to hopefully uh, get part of the PhD program. And in March, I was accepted to OIST. And uh, unfortunately, right at that time, the pandemic started to really um, be a full-blown thing uh, around the globe. So relocating to Japan during the pandemic was uh, pretty um, exceptional, I would say. But in November, uh, I managed to do so. And uh, shortly thereafter, uh, after one year of rotations uh, as a PhD student, I was accepted into uh, the thesis lab into Yokoyashi unit. Um, something interesting happened too. So I thought my ties with Switzerland were a little bit loose now that I'm in Japan. But actually, uh, this year in July, uh, our Swiss science consul, uh, Dr. Mösner, uh, visited us at OIST. So it was its first visit at OIST. And we got to enjoy some Okinawan dishes uh, at the local restaurant. So I think he was very impressed. And hopefully, we can establish uh, some more collaboration between Switzerland and OIST. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about my background, but only very briefly so that you get an idea uh, how I got to start a PhD in Japan. So I actually started out in industry and came to academia. I was a lab technician, so I did the apprenticeship, as it's called in Switzerland, in analytical chemistry, and worked as a lab technician at BASF uh, for two years in quality control. I decided I wanted to study uh, at the University of Applied Science, Northwestern Switzerland, in Basel or Mutens, uh, where I did a Bachelor in Molecular Life Sciences with specialization in chemistry. Uh, during that time, I worked part time, 50%. So I kept my ties to industry and was working on projects related to industry. Uh, my bachelor thesis was done at Howard in the Whitesides lab, uh, who is a very well published chemist uh, at Howard, and I did research on the origin of life, uh, mostly synthetic chemistry, uh, which was published in 2019. Uh, then I went to the University of Basel uh, because I figured a master in drug science would be interesting for me to learn more about uh, pharmaceuticals and medicine. So I pursued the master's and graduated uh, after 10 months of a master thesis, which was a uh, collaboration between industry, the University of Basel and uh, the University of Applied Sciences. So I was in the middle of three parties and it was actually a very fruitful collaboration, which hopefully leads to my manuscript being published soon. Let's hope for the best. Uh, afterwards, I came to OIST in January 21, uh, and I started at the nucleic acid chemistry unit, as I said before, and my work focuses on DNA hybrid asymmetric catalysis. So I combined DNA and chemistry to hopefully uh, catalyze some novel reaction. Uh, my thesis proposal is actually not finished yet, so my exam will be held in November 2022. So wish me luck. And I will still talk about uh, what I'm planning to research here at OIST now. So my proposed PhD project at OIST uh, involves chiral molecules. So as we know, in nature, many different chiral molecules exist, uh, amino acids, sugars, proteins, nucleic acid, but also medicine uh, such as penicillin or medicine such as ibuprofen. So interestingly, life is built on mostly left-handed amino acids and right-handed sugars. And chiral molecules are very important in pharmaceuticals too. But how do we get to these chiral molecules, for example, in pharmaceuticals? Usually, uh, Enzymatic reactions are asymmetric. So enzyme usually produce a very specific product that has one handedness. Um, but there's other molecules in nature that could potentially pass on this chirality onto other molecules that we want to synthesize. For example, DNA, which is inherently chiral and only exists in nature in one handed form. So uh, this could be potentially useful to make chiral drugs because as we see here, already in 2001, a book, Chiral Drugs, was published by Wiley and it already lists more than 2,500 known chiral drugs. So those are really important drugs and building blocks in chemistry. 
The handedness is closely related to the activity of the molecule because in biology, everything works with handedness. And this can be a beneficial effect or a harmful effect. So how can we get to an easy synthesis of more of these molecules that might have an application? Interestingly, uh, the research on DNA as a chiral scaffold is pretty old. It was first investigated in 2005, as I will show later. But how would that even work? Uh, here in this picture uh, that was published in 2022, very recently, there's a closer insight uh, into the mechanism. So here you can see a bipyridine modified DNA. So it's not natural DNA, it's bipyridine modified in a complex with an RNA molecule. And this bipyridine holds a copper metal ion in place in between the DNA strands that will pass on the chirality. The green molecules are reactants of this reaction, in this case, 5-methoxyindole and alpha-beta unsaturated 2-acyl imidazole, which uh, will participate in a Friedel-Crafts alkylation reaction. So as I said, this kind of uh, chiral scaffold uh, as a DNA was introduced by Beringa and Olfs in 2005 already. Uh, the benefits of using DNA are especially water compatibility, uh, which is important in green chemistry, uh, the specificity of this reaction that can be close to enzymatic specificity, and the chemical stability of DNA. So you can even use a little bit of solvent if necessary. Uh, the DNA that was used can be supramolecular, so um, the catalyst can be intercalating in the DNA or into the groove uh, implemented. The binding can also be covalent, as you can see in this picture, and also non-canonical DNA is used, and I will show later an example of non-canonical DNA uh, in this research field. So what am I planning to do with all of this? So here you can see a scheme uh, of what I want to do during my thesis. Uh, my first approach will involve a scaffold variation of this DNA. So on the left, the blue strand you can see is a bipyridine modified oligo. It's a single stranded DNA uh, that is modified with this bipyridine that can hold the copper metal ion. And I will add uh, unmodified oligos that have variating nucleotides, uh, which are called N in this picture. And I will anneal those in a buffer together with the metal iron to form uh, a novel scaffold of DNA that will hopefully form some sort of pocket together with the metal iron to facilitate asymmetric catalysis and push the equilibrium towards one of the enantiomers S or R. Uh, this is called a metal DNA hybrid catalyst. And I will analyze uh, these reaction outcomes using UPLC, where I screen the scaffolds for enantiomeric excess and yield of the reactions, and then can make an informed guess on what else uh, the oligos should implement to make the enantiomeric excess and the yield as high as possible. In the approach B, I will expand the reaction scope uh, that has been used in this uh, DNA-based asymmetric catalysis because it's pretty narrow so far. So let's jump into the approach A. Um, I will now explain a little bit more how exactly that works from DNA prochiral substrate to a chiral product. For example, here in a dl salda reaction, which will also yield chiral products. Uh, what has historically been used as a copper chelator uh, in these are different bipyridyl molecules. So, so important is the nitrogen that is in these uh, molecules that can capture the copper and hold it in place. And you can see next to the, um, next to the residues, the enantiomeric excesses that have been achieved up to 99%, which is uh, enzymatic level of enantiomeric excesses. Uh, later, uh, people started to covalently anchor the copper by these B 
pyridyl molecules uh, by modify a phosphoramidide, which is basically a nucleotide that has been modified with one of these bipyridyl molecules. So now I'm going to talk about uh, preliminary results that I actually achieved uh, using non-canonical DNA or G quadruplex DNA in this case. A G quadruplex is a higher order structure of DNA, and I will explain a little bit more about it. So what I did at first is modify my phosphoramidide with the spacer and the bipyridyl molecule to fine tune um, this nucleotide in the DNA so that it's available to bind the copper. Then I did solid phase synthesis to make this modified DNA. And I create scaffold with unmodified oligos uh, to form this G quadruplex um, DNA, which is non-canonical, formed by two, two strands. And you can see the guanine residues that bind in such a way that it forms a three-dimensional structure that is more higher order than just a double helix of DNA. This is stabilized by potassium ions that are implemented uh, in those G quadruplexes. So this scaffold should hold the copper in place and the nucleotides that are around it should force the reaction into one direction, uh, hopefully into S or R. So I performed the reaction in a small scale in a 96 well tube, and then I analyzed it via a high throughput analysis in UPLC to uh, assess the enantiomeric excess and the yield. So what was important here? What did I have to optimize? I had to design and synthesize an appropriate modified phosphoramidide, the linker length um, or the spacer length, the bipyridyl type, and where to implement it in the oligo, uh, in the whole length of the oligo was important here. Uh, I needed to design a DNA bed scaffold that is easily self-assembled in a 96 well tubes without doing much. And I wanted to add as little modified oligo as possible because it takes some time to do the solid phase synthesis. And the unmodified oligos can just be ordered from uh, dedicated companies that make them. I also wanted to think about novel reactions uh, that can be catalyzed and changing the metal iron, for example, and expanding the scope. So here I will present the preliminary results. And because they are not published yet, I will not exactly say what I implemented in the loop. But I can say that I use three vari variable nucleotides. And it yielded up to 81.1% enantiomeric excess. And this type of G quadruplex DNA hasn't really been investigated much yet. The reaction that I looked at was a Friedel Crafts alkylation reaction of 5 methoxyindole and alpha beta unsaturated 2 acyl imidazole. And I add a copper salt in buffer. And the only thing I had to do is wait three days and not steering, just at four degrees Celsius, and then uh, analyze the reaction mixture. So I thought, what if I uh, varied four different bases in the loop because it's the next plausible step to take? So here I yielded 87.6% enantiomeric excess. So I improved on the previous um, result. And I could already show that the nucleotide variation in this loop uh, influences the reaction outcome very clearly. I have from racemic outcome to 87.6% enantiomeric excess. Uh, I cannot say which sequences I use, but the TRID sequence seems to be um, very successful. And I easily assembled this catalyst using one modified strand and a variety of different strands uh, in all sorts of combinations of nucleotides. So how can we add a new twist to this? Because many people have investigated G quadruplex now. Many people have investigated uh, covalent catalysis. So I was thinking, um, what if I use DNA origami, especially since I'm in Japan? So I came across this uh, very old report of a four-way junction of DNA uh, that is formed uh, as seen in figure A. Uh, from four different strands. 
and it was published uh, by Seaman in 1983 already. And it looks flat on this picture, but at the bottom you can see that it can assume an open X, an ISO 1 or an ISO 2 confirmation. So I thought about how about making some sort of pocket that is similar to an enzyme within one of these DNA origamis, which are higher order structures of DNA, and trying to use that for asymmetric catalysis. And so on the right-hand side, you can see my scheme of how I visualize uh, this might work by bringing those nucleotides in close proximity to the bipyridyl and the catalytic center, the metal iron, I might be able to simulate um, some sort of metalloenzyme or an enzyme that how it is in nature. For that, I have to force uh, this structure into one specific um, isoform. And I can do that by varying the buffer contents, uh, which I will have to clearly screen during my PhD project. So what about the approach B, uh, the reaction scope of these reactions? So here you can see my literature review of all the reactions that have been done using DNA metal catalysts. And usually it involves uh, Diels-Alder reaction, Friedel-Crafts alkylations, and various sorts of Michael additions, cyclopropylation reaction, sulfur oxidation, uh, intramolecular Friedel-Crafts, fluorination reaction, and synhydration. Those are the main things. Uh, I need to find reactions that are asymmetric, that use metal ions, and that can, can be carried out in water. So those three constraints were a little bit hard to meet, but I found in literature two reactions that I will only briefly highlight. The synthesis of spiro-oxoindoles, which are very important building blocks for pharmaceuticals, and the alleloboration reactions, uh, which are, have a very narrow scope and the reactants are very highly influencing the outcome of the enantiomeric excess. So I will try to tweak my catalyst to make more um, reactants uh, available for this reaction. So to summarize, I looked at DNA beyond biology. This is my new twist for the DNA. I combine chemistry, DNA engineering, and maybe other fields of research in the future. And this research is rather interdisciplinary, uh, and this is facilitated by OIST, making it very easy to find collaborators and other people who might know different aspects about your work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Samira, for the very extensive um, and interesting presentation, not only about your research, but also about your background and your path to OIST. And at the same Thank time you. about opportunities at the Institute. And we do hope that you find collaborators uh, from among the audience. Um, this event is being recorded. Uh, please know that you can uh, find the video at a later date on our YouTube channel. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please stay for the Q&A. And I would like to encourage our audience to post their queries in the Q&A uh, box on Zoom. Our next presenter is going to talk about a little bit different topic, still the same institute. Uh, Alexandra Gavrilova, uh, research and education in Japan and Russia. She's a PhD candidate at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. So Alexandra, if you could uh, please share your slides. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. I would like to talk about my education and research background in Russia and Japan. Uh, so first, I would like to start with the short self-introduction. I was born in Yurmala, it's in Latvia, uh, and I've been living there for almost 13 years. And after I moved to the, to the St. Petersburg in Russia, where I've been studying and um, working for another 10, 12 years. Um, in my spare time, I like hiking, cooking, snorkeling, uh, playing piano, and now I start to learn guitar. 
Uh, also, I love uh, learning languages. In particular, well, as you may know, Russian is my uh, native language, but also I know English and French. At some point at school, I've been learning uh, German and Spanish, and now I'm extensively want to learn Japanese and Hebrew. So these are my goals. So as for education, when I was in Russia, uh, I was studying in Peter the Great St. Petersburg Polytechnic University. Uh, for four years was my bachelor thesis, bachelor work. And um, the field was in biophysics and I finished this degree with honors. Uh, the next two years, uh, I've been doing my master's in applied physics in the same university, and also I was I graduated with honors. My background is uh, highly interdisciplinary, and I received a very fundamental background in many fields, but mostly by physics, math, physics, chemistry. But because I switched in my master's to more neuroscientific driven work and studies, I also had many courses in crystallography, neuroscience, neurophysiology, and more advanced biology. Um, during my studies, like bachelor and master's, I had many practical courses in different labs. And later I will talk about it. Um, so basically, yeah, uh, as for research in Russia, I've been working in nine labs under, uh, during my undergraduate studies and in one lab after graduation. I will not mention all of this, of course, only the most meaningful ones. So this one uh, is Laboratory of Molecular Neurodegeneration. I've been working there for almost um, three years during my, mm, oh no, sorry, four years during my two year, last two years in bachelor's and my whole master's degree. The main uh, directions of uh, this laboratory research were uh, investigation of uh, different mechanisms of uh, neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease, Huntington disease, and ataxia. And in particular, my research uh, consisted in investigation of impairments uh, of cognitive cells activity and analysis of motor behavior impairments in transgenic mice models of ataxia type 2 and Huntington disease. And based on this research, I've been doing my master and bachelor thesis. And as a result of which, we published three papers with my contribution. After graduation, I've been working in the laboratory of hydrobiology and ichthyology before coming to OIST. Uh, this lab was located in a different university, our second uh, main university in the city, St. Petersburg State University. And I've been studying the transmissible cancer finish in uh, Metellus trosterus from White Sea. This was a very short research for uh, only half a year because I had to work somewhere before studying my PhD at OIST. So it was post graduation and I learned a lot of different methods, much more different what I've been using in previous laboratory. But yeah, it was a really good experience for me. So next I would like to talk about education and research in Japan. And my journey to OIST was also complicated and long. Uh, everything started uh, in July 2019, where I went to Shanghai University in China to do the internship, the summer school there. It was in my first year of my master, the, uh, master's degree, and after that, I decided that I would like to go abroad for studies, for future research and uh, living. And then after the internship, I started to search for different PhD programs mainly in the Francophone countries, because I, I know French, I passed the DELF exam for B2 level, and I would like to, wanted to study in these countries like Switzerland, Belgium, and France. And I mostly was looking for PhD there. But of course, I didn't allow the opportunity to go somewhere else. And uh, in November 2019, I received an offer to do an internship at Poist 
for the next summer, like in 2020, but because of the COVID, first it was postponed, but after it was canceled because I received an offer to the PhD. But meantime, like in between these events, I also received offer to the PhD in Israel. And actually I've been thinking a lot about where to go to Israel or Japan. And I decided to go to OIST. Uh, and in July, I was accepted to the PhD here. And in December, two years ago, I was relocating and I relocated to Japan during this COVID pandemics. So now I'm a second year PhD student at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. And I just would like to talk to you about our educational system, uh, how it's going on here. So during the first year, students, PhD students usually uh, have rotations in three labs. Two of them are in-field, one of them is out of field. And meanwhile, during the whole year, you have different courses, professional career development activities where you participate and engage with other PG students and with local school and uh, like high school children, Japanese speaking. And on your second to fifth year, uh, for example, currently I'm writing my thesis proposal and uh, in a while I will have the examination. For the next two years, I will work in a lab obtain data, analyze it, like, um, and uh, in the last year, hopefully 2025, I will prepare the manuscript, uh, probably publish paper, and will have the thesis defense for the PhD thesis. So this is roughly how it's going on. Of course, the months that I put here, it's for me, of course, but they are pretty much the same for everybody else. So as for research, I'm working now in optical neuroimaging unit. Here is our huge lab. I think it's one of the biggest in the OIST. Uh, my professor Bernd Kuhn actually, he's German uh, with a background in physical chemistry. And um, the main directions in our lab are cerebellum research, cortical, astrocytes, and modeling. Modeling, I mean, the creation of models of, for example, booking neurons using electron microscopy and other technologies. And I joined this lab in January 2022, so almost a year ago. And I just would like to briefly introduce you what I've been doing in the lab, like the theoretical background and a little bit about my, I guess, thesis proposal direction. So, have you ever thought about how do we walk in different contexts? For example, we have different surfaces like sand or stone. We can resist to different forces like wind. Uh, we can walk immediately and change our gait when walking on the faster or slower surface like this travelator in the airport. Or we can even move backwards when necessary. So. We're all able to do those things without really thinking about it. How do we do? So we do it automatically, almost automatically without any delays and problems. And I was thinking, what are the causes of these switches? Why do? Why can we switch it so fast and efficiently? And it was found that this context-dependent behavior, in particular locomotion, uh, was dependent on the cerebellum. So cerebellum, in particular cerebellar cortex, consists on, of many cells. I will not go into details, but just um, the main uh, cell is Purkinje cell. Uh, it's one of the biggest in our brain. It has this uh, really beautiful uh, arbor dendrites. And it generates two types of signals, simple spikes and complex spikes. Simple spikes usually fire with high frequency from 20 to 200 hertz. Uh, complex spikes, they fire much with much more lower uh, frequency from one to two hertz. And I was thinking like, how all our efficient movements are controlled with all this, like uh, such a low frequency of the signals. 
and that makes the synapse of complex spike and protein cell a really powerful synapse in neuro neural system. I investigated further and found out that complex spikes, they can encode, for example, probability of the action, readiness to act, to do something. They can encode sensory motors, uh, uh, sensory motor errors, and even kinematic parameters. And all this was done in different behavior. For example, in eye blink conditioning of, or whisker movement or arm reaching and locomotion. But locomotion has been studied not that extensively uh, due to difficulty of putting an animal on a treadmill, for example, and forcing it to run or walk in particular speeds, but it, it, can, it uh, can be done. And it was, in, it was done uh, decades ago, but uh, there is no information what exactly do complex spikes encode during uh, locomotion in different contexts. So hopefully I will study that. And the first step was to formulate the possible hypothesis. And I think that uh, complex spike activity pattern may be different um, during locomotion with tactile and resistant discrimination. So I created, I will create uh, different contexts for locomotion for, for the mice. And this is the behavior and the experimental plan. So I have I will have mouse um, just walking uh, on wheels with different surfaces. So the blue line uh, determines the rough surface, and the green line is for the smooth surface. And the level of shades inside the surface represent um, the resistance of the wheel. So with more resistance, if the wheel is more resistant, the mouse will have to make more efforts to run. And probably that will cause different complex spikes firing patterns in the brain. And all of this I will record using two photo microscopy that we have in our lab. And um, as suggestions, as uh, pro proposals, I would suggest that if the complex spikes are, dif are really different, if the parameters will be different, then it would uh, mean that um, they really encode the parameters of the context, like surface and resistance. But if these patterns are not different, that would mean that um, they do not encode the context itself, most likely probably the saliency of the sensory stimuli or just something, or the signal that something has changed. But nobody knows and I'd like to go in this direction and to find out. So the first steps would be to establish several techniques. And I learned during my rotation and currently I improve my skills in uh, chronic cranial window surgery. And that is the main method that we use. Uh, also, I would like to show you the calcium imaging from procedure cells dendrites that I managed to do recently. Uh, and also, I have done the reconstruction of the Purkinje cells in the cerebellar cortex, also using two photo microscopy. And um, it's not for the proposal, it was during rotation, but I just wanted to show you how these Purkinje cells, how, they are, how beautiful they are. Uh, I used the focal microscopy to do so in cerebellar slides. Eventually, this image was. Um, I uh, I participated in our exhibition, science images exhibition at OIST, and in particular, this image uh, out of other two was chosen. So as for behavior experiments, they are currently in process. So I will not show you any data about that because they're not finished. And thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed my talk and feel free to reach me out in some social media or ask me some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Again, a great presentation. We heard about um, 
Alexandra's uh, career path and how she actually got to OIST and uh, what her research is going to be and the results, the current results. Uh, wish you lots of um, success with that and a totally different discipline at the same institute, just to show you what kind of diversity we have at uh, OIST. Um, our next presenter is uh, Isabella Porewska, and uh, she is going to present about when comfort zone is no longer comfortable, children's social functioning. She's a PhD candidate at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. So Isabella, if you could please uh, share your slides. Thank you, you did. Um, sorry. Yes. Um, good morning uh, to everyone in Europe. Good afternoon to everyone in Japan. And uh, so I am quite mindful that we're running a little bit late. Uh, so I'll try to be uh, as concise as possible. Um, my talk is going to consist of three parts. First, I'm going to talk to you actually about my research, what I'm doing at the moment. I am at the same stage uh, as uh, my predecessors. So I'm also in my second year. I'm also preparing for my research proposal exam. Uh, and I'm studying children's social factors. Functioning. So this is what I'm going to briefly talk to you about. Um, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my way to studying here in at OIST and in Japan. And then I'm going to elaborate a little bit uh, on this mysterious topic that I chose uh, for today's presentation. When I was thinking about my research, I chose to do uh, my PhD in the lab that works with uh, children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. There's a high chance that you have previously had an abbreviation of ADHD. Um, there's 17 of us um, here right now. Um, the approximate prevalence of ADHD is around 5% worldwide. So there's quite a high chance that we have at least one person. Uh, with ADHD in the audience. Um, ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder. This is quite a controversy at the moment, um, but uh, to be diagnosed with ADHD, uh, one needs to show symptoms uh, before uh, the 12 years old. Um, symptoms uh, can be grouped into um, two um, different um yeah groups um so one of them is inattention that means that children have trouble uh focusing that they are highly distractible um and that they're forgetful and make careless mistakes because they just refuse to um focus on um, certain topics um and into a group of hyperactive symptoms where somebody can appear as if they're driven by the motto uh, as if they're constantly on the go when they're climbing or squirming or fidgeting or standing up whenever it's appropriate to be seated uh, just because it's stronger than them um this urge uh, to actually constantly move the etiology of adhd uh, is still unclear so there are some uh, probable genetic factors that contribute to the development of ADHD. There are some environmental factors, um, but this question has still not been resolved. And with ADHD, apart from the core symptoms that I have just mentioned, there are associated difficulties. And among these associated difficulties, um, one of the, well, I don't want to say most common, but um, one of the most problematic is social difficulties. So literature shows and clinical reports also show that, that children with ADHD are often rejected by their peers. So they can be voted least liked in classrooms. They have trouble forming friendships and maintaining these friendships. And um, they also often um, point to um, other children, for example, in classroom, uh, whom they call their best friend, but this friendship is not reciprocated. That happens quite a lot. Um, children with ADHD also have difficulties in social cognition. That means that they are not great at reading social cues, that they're not, um, that they don't perform as well as the typically developing peers in recognizing emotions, for example. Um, Children with ADHD often perform poorer 
in social situations than typically developing children. The, uh, the more aggressive, the more demanding towards their partners in interactions, uh, they are less likely to take their uh, partners uh, in interactions needs and feelings into consideration when negotiating with them, for example. Um, before we move on, what is really, really important uh, to know is that these difficulties are not synonymous with ADHD, and there's also a huge variety. Not all children with ADHD have social difficulties. Around a half of them actually has them. And um, just because a child is diagnosed with ADHD doesn't mean that they're going to have them. And just because somebody has these difficulties doesn't mean that they're going to have ADHD. I needed to say that. Um, there are certain interventions, psychosocial interventions designed uh, for tackling problems uh, with social interactions in ADHD, but they have been really proven not very effective. Um, from clinical reports, um, we also know that parents often report that children um, like to be dominant uh, in their place, they like to lead, and um, they show excessive levels of frustrations. Uh, of frustration if um, their ideas are not accepted um, by their peers. Um, that can lead to strained social relationships. And it's really important because it has been shown that not only children with ADHD, but all children, uh, if they experience rejection by peers in childhood, that can lead and often leads to behavioral maladjustments, to academic problems later in life, and uh, to a disability, to work with their own emotions. Uh, I have gotten deeper into the topic and um, did a review of the literature and realized that actually in most cases, um, research on ADHD is sort of done from the perspective of everyone around the child with ADHD. So everyone is asked how much you like this person, uh, how, how is interaction with this person going? But since the interventions have been proven effective and we know that children with ADHD actually exhibit a lot of problems, shouldn't we really be tackling this problem from the perspective of the child with ADHD? So that's what I thought I would do. I would rather ask the child with, the, with ADHD how they feel during a social interaction um, and maybe then try to find a problem. Um, what I'm... What I'm aiming to do is I'm going to assess um, certain aspects of social interactions in children with ADHD. I'm going to see if other associated difficulties that I haven't mentioned before, like working memory or the ability to take perspective, um, how it influences their performance uh, in social interactions. And also I'm going to see if we can actually target specific impairments or deficits uh, to create better interventions. Um, for my studies, I'm going to assess a group of children with ADHD and a group of typically developing children so that it gives me a chance to compare if children with ADHD do behave out of norm. Um, I'm going to design specific tasks uh, to measure the performance, but I'm also going to use the available materials to measure the associated difficulties, the, the cognitive measures, um, to see if what I have previously stated is actually true, um, that children do have these, um, these deficits. And I'm also going to take into consideration the parents and guardians uh, measures on children, their opinion on their social functioning, because I want to see if there's any sort of directional prediction. Uh, and to design my tasks, I actually had to do quite a lot of exercise, mind exercise, um, because I did not want to be repetitive. I wanted to do something completely new that will actually maybe shed the light. So um, from observing children in my everyday work, I've realized that it's actually often quite obvious for them what should be done in a situation. And after the situation is done, they usually know what should have been done but somehow they're not really able to perform the way that they say. So I want to see if there's any difference 
um, in what solutions they propose, um, depending on whether they observe other people interacting or whether they are part of the interaction. And I also want to see that in different aspects of social interactions, and here I'm saying conflict specifically, because well, it's a PhD, it's only three years, so I really need to focus. So I'm going to be looking at um, real life scenarios that have a potential of becoming a minor conflict. Uh, in, um, in the um, other versus so um, aspect of my studies, um, like I said, I'm going to present children with different stories um, and I'm going to ask them different questions depending on whether they see somebody else interacting with a child or if they are made believe that they are the ones interacting with the child. And the aspects of the conflict I'm going to measure are, um, well, if you are um, in a part of the conflict or if you are observing the conflict, what do you think can be done for this conflict to be resolved? I'm also going to ask them, what do you think the certain person will do in this conflict? Because that will also measure their ability to take perspective, their theory of mind, and their ability to predict um, what other people do, how they behave, and also what they want from them. Because that might be the part that is actually um, a little deficient in children with ADHD. And after the conflict is, well, either resolved or after the situation is done, I'm also going to ask them who is actually to blame here, who is responsible for what happened. Because there is, there, there is some evidence coming from clinical reports that maybe, maybe they're okay um, judging this um, and there's other people uh, in, in the situation, but maybe they're not that good in taking responsibility for their own actions. Well, uh, like we said, this is the work in progress. And my main um, aim at the end of this is actually to um, tackle some problems that can be targeted through psychosocial interventions. Well, that's enough for my research. Uh, I will now... Um, talk to you a little bit about how I got there. So I originally come from Poland um, and I did my bachelor's thesis, uh, my bachelor's degree uh, at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland. And I did that in neurobiology. Then I did my master's in uh, Germany at the University of Bonn um, in neurosciences. And now I'm here at OIS. And it looks pretty straightforward, right? It's la la la. It's actually not. So when I was uh, in Krakow, uh, and I studied neurobiology, I had a huge interest in molecular biology. And I studied prions. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term, but I'm pretty sure that you've previously heard about mad cow disease. So these are the agents that actually um, make the mad, mad cow disease happen. Um, yes, and you know, I, I worked in the wet lab. I wore the um, lab uh, coat every day. Um, and when I was in Poland, when I was doing my undergrad studies, um, I was very interested in um, going abroad, but I couldn't afford it. Uh, I didn't know what opportunities there were. Um, so um, my first internship I did actually after the second year, I did it at the Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases in Germany, in Bonn. And uh, for that, I uh, was funded by the Erasmus Plus program, which is something that should be available at most uh, universities in Europe, big or small. So this is a great opportunity to get um, any experience of living abroad, um, working abroad and expanding your horizons scientifically, but also socially quite a lot. I liked it in Bonn. I went back the next year. I have become the research assistant during the summer. So I actually got paid this time, which, you know, I'm I'm making fun of now, but that's actually really important, guys. We're, we're in our early 20s. Um, we can't expect our parents to pay for everything. And we really want to, um, we really want to go forward. 
Um, because I liked it in Germany so much, I applied for a DRD scholarship for graduates of all disciplines, and I was lucky enough to get it. And um, that was when I went to study in Bonn. I studied neurosciences. But that was also the time when I realized that I really do not want to spend the rest of my lab of my life in the wet lab, not because it's not interesting, but just because. And that's not going to sound great, but because I was good at it and because it was comfortable. Uh, but it was really not something that I was passionate about. So going into the program in neurosciences, at the beginning of my master's, I knew that I am probably making a mistake um, going into this pathway where everyone is interested in molecular biology. And I started off um, seeking other opportunities. I did one of my lab rotations in Potsdam where uh, I had my first experience in uh, working with human subjects. Then I did my master's thesis uh, in Bonn, also on human subjects, on neuroimaging. And then before I applied for any PhD, I have decided I need to uh, gain a little bit more experience in working with humans. I was already determined to uh, conduct experiments of children uh, and I applied for a research internship at OIST. I did it um, both with human development on neurobiology unit that I'm in right now and neuronal rhythms in movement uh, unit. Um, that was a collaboration. Um, and I am at OIST now uh, because also if it wasn't for the internship I don't know if it would be that easy for me to just throw everything that I had back in Europe and move all my life across the continent. Um, so I think the research internship is a fantastic opportunity um, for you to see whether Okinawa is the place for you to live, whether you can find a professor here that you actually want to stay with and do your PhD, and whether this is the place that you want to develop in. And while we're mostly talking about the research here, and while we're focusing on our scientific careers, it's also important to remember that not for everyone research is their whole life and probably not for everyone it should be and there's a lot of opportunities at OIST um, where you are actually calm enough about your future and about your presence where you're not worried about funding where you actually work in a really safe environment uh, safe I mean socially um, that you can also expand into different areas of life and do things that interest you the most. I am a part of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee here at OIST, uh, we've got DEY, uh, because the cause is just very close to my heart. Um, I am often engaged in public speaking events and I am one of the funders of the Orators Club here at OIST. And um, I do things outside of the university as well. I am a coordinator of and counselor of student summer programs uh, back home and in the US. And I also do a lot of um, work on translations just because like, uh, uh, like Alexandra, I also like uh, foreign languages and um, I translate from German to Polish and from Polish to German um, just for fun. Um, so it is one thing that I would like you to take from my talk. You might not remember what my research is about. That's fine. You can always write to me on LinkedIn if you're interested in that. But I think you've seen uh, in all three of our presentations that the thing that brought us to Japan was being mobile from the beginning. And it's really, really important to gain any experience that's possible. It's not always easy. And it's um, and not for every country, there are as many opportunities as there are for others, but you really, really have to persist and work and work and work. Uh, and at some point, um, you're definitely going to get where you are going to be. And, you know, if it takes a lot of time, well, you know, if it's not difficult, you're probably not doing the right thing. So, um, well, we hope to see you at OIST, um, but if not at OIST, just, you know, go and expand your horizons and, when we come to Japan, it's a really cool country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabella. Again, a very different perspective, a different career path, and apparently the same OIST. 
So multiple opportunities at the Institute and to hear more about um, what kind of um, opportunities researchers can find. You're going to hear from um, Jonas Fischer, academic coordinator at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, uh, this graduate university. Opportunities at OIST is the title of his presentation. So this time you will only hear about the bureaucracy side, if I may. Sure, thank you, Judith. So I guess you can already see the presentation. Maybe just a few words about myself. My name is Jonas Fischer. I'm originally from Germany, where I also did a PhD on experimental solid state physics. Then I did a postdoc at the University of Tokyo, after which I kind of switched into this research management side. First, I worked at Tokyo University in Sendai in the northeast of Japan, and now kind of went all the way to the opposite side of Japan, to the very south, which is the uh, Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, where I'm now visiting, uh, where I'm now working as a coordinator of the visiting programs. And today I will not just talk about the visiting programs, but all kinds of opportunities and a little bit about OIST in general. But of course, I won't focus so much on the PhD programs and the internships because you heard about it and the previous speakers are much more knowledgeable about it and can probably answer your questions. So first, maybe we didn't see it before, OIST is um, of course a part of Japan, but it's quite far from the mainland, actually closer to Taiwan in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And OIST itself on the main island of Okinawa, it kind of sits in the middle, more or less inside a jungle. You can see uh, the buildings behind me, they were built on the hills and in the valleys, it's still the original jungle. So um, about OIST, why is OIST a special institute? What makes it unique? So um, it's when it was founded about 10 or maybe 12 years ago, uh, the people who did it looked at success stories around the world and made OIST in a way so that it um, kind of mirrors successful institutes around the world. It is somewhat unique within Japan in that English is the main language. Most of the uh, PhD students and researchers are also from international backgrounds. And maybe the most unique thing is the interdisciplinary research. So you've seen it in the talks before. Most people, most researchers and students at OIST don't focus just in one direction. There are no departments, so any kind of research units can work, work with each other and always usually span across several fields. Also, the student to faculty ratio is very good, so you're not going to be one of 20 students in a lab if you would work at OIST. And maybe this is the most important part for later stages of the careers. You don't have to worry so much about funding because usually the research units are funded for five years in one go, and then the researchers can focus on their research instead of constantly writing grant applications. And the idea is that OIST would help the scientific community around the world, but also help economic growth here in Okinawa and of course in Japan, and also build connections to industry and entrepreneurship, something I will talk a little bit later. So yeah, this. Um, I already mentioned many of these points, the high trust funding, the interdisciplinary research, and also the governance of OIST is kind of unique in Japan, but maybe that's not so important for people who are looking for funding opportunities at OIST. Yeah, so this is kind of um, a slide that puts it down into three main principles. So OIST wants to be world leading research facility that benefits humanity. So all the uh, topics that are focused here are, uh, look in some way towards solutions for the future. It should also be a great place to learn and work and focus on innovation and have a good administration, which I'm a part of in this case. And it wants to be a partner of the innovation and uh, economy in Okinawa, Japan, and to some extent worldwide. Okay, so uh, maybe one point that many don't know about OIS. So if you look at the nature index and if you uh, look at the one that is normalized, so that means you um, divide by the number of researchers and students at an institute, then suddenly OIS is number one in Japan and number nine across the whole world. 
So the reason that OIST is not high on the normal ranking is that OIST is quite small. But if you look at the number of researchers, then OIST has a very high impact. It publishes a lot of high impact papers and also a lot of patents and so on. So OIST is a very successful research institute that is still small but growing, and I think it's a great place to be. And maybe you heard about this. So one of OIST adjunct professors, Swante Pebo, got very recently awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct humans and human evolution. So he also just gave a talk maybe two, three months ago about this at OIST, and then very soon after got the Nobel Prize. And um, also in the Nobel Prize in Physics this year, there was some connection to OIST. So Anton Seilinger, he's um, at the University of Vienna in Austria. He was awarded the Physics Prize for demonstrating the phenomenon of quantum teleportation. And he just very recently received an honorary doc doctorate from OIST and of course also gave a presentation. So um, there's kind of a good way to interact with Nobel laureates if you come to OIST. Okay, so the PhD program, we already heard about this a little bit, and I actually don't know it so well, so maybe it's better for other people to talk about their own experience. So uh, just a few statistics, PhD students are 81% international, and the faculty is 55% international. So OIST is, of course, a Japanese university, but um, within OIST, everything is conducted in English. And it's really nice to see people from all across the world and have this like different backgrounds, different experiences to lean on and get different perspectives. So maybe this is also interesting to people who are interested in a PhD or other position at OIST. So among the alumni who did the PhD at OIST, Many went on to stay in academia, but also some went on to industry or other positions. Just a few examples here. So many went on to um, prestigious postdocs positions, became assistant professors, some became editor at Nature, or uh, various researcher or other positions in companies all around the world. And this is something that always also helps to some extent. There are often Symposia held together with companies, for example, in this picture, Hitachi, uh, to get people connections uh, to the industry. So these kind of career fairs or other events. Okay, so on to postdoc positions for maybe those of you who are currently doing a PhD. So of course you can just contact a researcher at OIST to ask if there are positions in their units. And another great way, which I think is very interesting and quite new, is this interdisciplinary postdoctoral post scholar fellowship called IPSF. So this is new, which just started last year, and it provides the opportunity for a researcher to come to OIST and pick two or maybe even more units with which they want to work. And then basically they do their own project, but get mentorship from two usually dis different discipline researchers so they can really go with an interdisciplinary approach for their research and do a unique project, which is um, also gets you a competitive salary and at least a two-year contract at OIST, and you do your own independent research. So if you're interested in this program, the application is currently open and I'm actually in charge of it, so just write me an email, I will show my email address later. And uh, another thing that OIST recently is quite strong at is innovation and startups. So um, OIST already throughout the 10 years, a little bit more of its history, there were lots of patent applications, patents granted. So it's strong in innovation because all the research focuses on some ways to uh, benefit humanity. And now recently there's a startup incubator directly at OIST. So currently there are 11 startups in the incubator or maybe the 11 is the total number. Currently there is eight. The OIST um, got a lot of funding raised. So 300 million Japanese yen. And recently there were some additional new contracts signed. So this funding is increasing constantly. And there's also a startup accelerator program where the application is open just right now. Um, and well, if you have some kind of startup or know someone, then certainly please take a look at the website shown here on the left. And maybe that's a good opportunity for you.
So I mentioned this before, this is probably most important for people who are looking for a permanent position in research who want to become assistant professor, associate professor, professors. So if you actually be, get a position at OIST, then you will get this high trust funding, which means that only every five years there will be a review. And basically the OIST Institute puts a lot of trust into the researchers, so they do more or less whatever they want. And then um, only after five years, it is looked at how successful they were and if their funding will be renewed. So they really don't have to worry much about grants and all these things that are a headache for many researchers. And there too, we currently have an open call for applications. So if you're interested in a tenure track or tenured faculty positions, please take a look on the faculty recruiting website. The um, quantum information science and quantum technology call and cybersecurity calls are open until the end of November. The one for life sciences has just closed two days ago. But still, if you're in that field, you can probably still take a look and maybe submit a late application. So finally, on to what I'm actually doing at OIS. So I'm in charge on the, of the visiting programs. Uh, one is for distinguished um, scientists. So this is usually for very quite senior professors that are famous and come to OIS for a sabbatical. And the other one, much bigger one, is the theoretical sciences visiting program. So the idea is that um, mathematics and theoretical physics and theoretical life science, computational sciences, are basically based on the exchange of ideas. So we need researchers from other institutes to come to Okinawa for a workshop or for discussions, talk to the researchers here, develop new ideas, um, and work together on projects. So visitors coming here are free to collaborate, of course, with anyone at OIS. And another case of this interdisciplinarity. So once the visitors here, they're not just visitors of one group, they can interact with all of OIST. And visitors have really, in their feedback on the program, said this is a great thing that you cannot just work with a few people in your own field, but with anyone and really get some new ideas. So we just had the calls open for these events. So there will be, of course, calls again next year. So if you're interested in, uh, so if you already, this is from senior postdocs on your onward, if you already um, have some research position and want to come to OIST for a few months, then certainly take a look. And if you have any questions about this, please ask me. So yeah, with that, um, that's the end of my talk. Just a brief overview of the opportunities at OIST. And if you have any questions, please be sure to contact me. If I don't know it myself, I will forward you to the people in charge. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you, Jonas, so much. And um, what can I say? Extensive opportunities, a uh, lot to choose from, uh, literally all levels of, of research. So you take your pick. And uh, those of you who are in the webinar, if you have any questions to Jonas or any of the other speakers who are online at the moment, please type your questions in the Q&A box. We do have uh, one initial uh, question. So you mentioned that it's a good idea to, and not only you, but Jonas, but uh, several other speakers today mentioned that it's a good idea to actually strike up conversation, uh, a conversation with the prospective um, um, research uh, um, leaders, or shirokyo in as we say in, in Japanese. And uh, I was wondering if um, there is a central email address or uh, prospective applicants can actually uh, find the email addresses online. I often get this query that um, uh, students or prospective students cannot locate uh, the email addresses. So what's the procedure? Uh, should they contact you first and you can uh, redirect them to the relevant uh, uh, professors or what's your suggestion? So, yeah, sure. If you look at the, take a look at the OIS careers page, there's uh, at the very bottom, there's a, just central inquiries, but that's usually no, not what you want to do. You want to contact the researcher directly. And there's an overview page of all the research units at OIST. And I think all of them have the email address actually on the website. So in my experience, if you contact the principal researcher at OIST directly, they will usually reply. 
and uh, if you're interested in position at their uh, unit, then you can probably find some way together if they want to work with you, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions from the audience at this point? If there are no questions, then we are just going to proceed with the rest of the webinar. And um, if you have any questions later, please send us an email to japan at uroxas.net. Uh, feel free to contact any of the speakers today. Some of them actually uh, posted their email addresses in their presentations. Uh, at the same time, if you do watch this recording at a later stage, uh, please let us know if you need a tailor-made personal advice. I'm sure that Jonas and uh, also your access will be happy to assist you. So any other questions? And I was wondering if our speakers have any questions to any of the other speakers, because that often happens too. Now is the time to ask. Or is this a small place? We see each other in the hallways every day. <laughs> Yeah, which means it's basically like a small village, uh, or I should say a big family. That's something I really would have liked, you know, when I was a, a, a researcher at a university. Uh, yeah, big places tend to uh, kind of alienate uh, people. But um, if you have like a small family to support you in a foreign country, I think that's priceless. So that's another plus for OIST. Yeah. Uh, so we do there have a is question. a question in the chat. Yes. Um, so the earliest opportunities at OIS start from PhD is the question, but the answer is no. There's earlier opportunities, there's lots of summer programs to get like a, an early look at OIS and these uh, student internships. So basically you take a look how it would be and then maybe um, you can start a PhD later. But the earliest like uh, student stage at OIS is actually like PhD, which includes a master. And thank you, Jonas. Any other questions? Um, yes, I'm particularly interested in the startup opportunities at OIST. Is there any specific program to encourage students to, to try startup? How do you involve venture capitalists in Japan, venture capitals in Japan for fundraising? Mm. So the OIST now has something called the Technology and Innovation Center, which is like the own department to uh, do this innovation and industry collaborations and help out the startups. So they have lots of connections in the startup section and industry with Japan. And if you like uh, apply for one of their rounds for startups, or if you contact them and if you're at OIST, then they will suddenly help you out make connections. Thank you so much. Um, actually, I do have a question in connection with that. Uh, there are some cities in Japan, for example, Fukuoka among them, uh, which actually support startups, uh, foreign startups with uh, venture capital. So they do offer money and a visa initially for one year and then uh, for an, an additional year if um, the business model is successful. I'm wondering if um, OIS can um, assist the researchers with the contacts in that uh, con um Sorry, so if uh, OIS can assist researchers in that regard, or if you know of any opportunities uh, on a municipal level that can help uh, prospective uh, venture capitalist um, uh, investors or with visa or uh, startup idealists who are hoping to, you know, kind of realize their projects. So uh, I don't personally know this, I must admit. So I don't know how you would come from abroad to uh, like with your startup to come to Japan, but I'm sure like the technology and innovation hub here at OIS, they can help you with these kind of things. So if you contact me, I will have to forward it. And um, I'm sure there's some ways because that's basically their main thing that they do. Thank you so much. Um, another question. I also wonder if speakers today are interested in startups or working for industries in the future. Well, speakers. <laughs> Actually, I was thinking about that because I am building now behavioral setup. It's not ready yet, but I think if it will work, we have to test it with my experiments and if it works, I would really like to commercialize it. 
because uh, there is no like analog setups in the world and actually it would be really useful just you know to record neural activity during locomotion and actually it is was it was really difficult to do before and i didn't really know why people didn't try to build such setup but currently we're working on that and if it works if everything is great and like my supervisor will support this i was planning to commercialize it to uh, you know participate in the startup programs uh, like i missed the deadlines for this year but i will uh, i think participate next year when i will have more results and you know perspectives but yeah in the future for the future like work i was thinking like academia or industry if that's what the question was yeah but i didn't i didn't decide yet because i like academic work so far yeah that, thank you so much alexandra um isabella and samira well i am switching fields to psychology um I think it's been established that psychology cannot really be monetized. Uh, so industry is probably uh, not my future. Um, but yeah, I am I am thinking if you know if if I don't decide to stay in academia, um, I might actually pursue um, a career in education or in policy making. Um, so there are a lot of different directions that we're going to go in that we can go in. But I don't think that you know my answer is any relevant to the question. I think the person is particularly interested in the industry so not me what about Samira yeah to be honest um uh, just to um, relate to your answer um uh, I do have some acquaintances that uh, work in industry uh with the psychology degrees um so they are employed specifically to provide uh, coaching and um, uh, mental health uh, services to professionals uh because of the pressures of work um, there are several um, researchers, uh, engineers, uh, uh, marketing specialists who are under an extreme uh, a strain during work. So uh, these specialists act actually are employed um, in-house by the companies to provide assistance and kind of boost productivity. So in that way, I think, um, you know, such a degree and experience can be monetized in, in the best uh, uh, possible way. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really good point. You need to be a clinical psychologist, though, to do therapy or to do coaching. So, um, yeah, but uh, there are also not, opportunities not for psychologists in in, um, wow. uh, in industry. Um, that was sort of, you know, a joke. Um, but yeah, there, there, there is um, research on decision making, uh, for example, that is conducted by psychologists in um, advertisement markets, for example. So, yeah. There is an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Samira. Okay, I am now 30 years old. And if I proceed in academia, I fear that I will be like, let's say up to professor, I will be 40 until I finally start something. So I will definitely go back into industry or maybe pick up uh, an old hobby that I had. So originally I wanted to study uh, creative writing. Uh, which is completely different from chemistry, obviously. Uh, but then I, I stuck with chemistry up to like now the PhD. So maybe what would be interesting is combining uh, science with some sort of uh, science communication or like scientific writing. Uh, that's also an option for me that I would want to pursue, but it's definitely not going to be academia for me. <laughs> yeah, I came from industry and I will probably go back. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, actually, creative writing and uh, science research can be super useful when it comes to science communication. You would be surprised how many scientists actually struggle to kind of um, uh, write uh, uh, proposals, even for ERC or MSCA grants. And uh, to actually receive these grants, one has to communicate science in such a way that the lay um, 
uh, proposal evaluators would understand at least a gist, you know, of what uh, the person is is uh, proposing to research. So I think there is a, there is a market uh, for science communicators, you know, who can uh, kind of water down and simplify, you know, research for um, lay people and society in general. So yeah, I do think you have a future um, in kind of combining, yeah. um, you know, creative writing and science at the same time. Yeah. So as you could see, somebody at Oyster followed up on that and went to Nature publication. So, and I know, uh, personally know someone else who recently graduated and went on into a scientific communication career. So this place is not necessarily like, it's maybe a detour a little bit, but definitely I can learn a lot here. And we are gonna have a scientific communication uh, workshop tomorrow and on Friday, there will be a forum. So it's definitely also always a good place to be for scientific communication as well. Thank you so much. Any other questions? We still have uh, five minutes from the Q&A. So if you have any questions, now is the time to ask or send us an email later. Okay, well, in any case, um, uh, Jonas Fischer's presentation is going to be available on our website on the event page. So should you like to know more about these opportunities and you kind of missed the gist of the presentation, um, you will have the chance to consult the uh, PDF file. And at the same time, the recording will also go online at a later date. So feel free to rewatch the video later and follow us on um, all our SNS. No questions at this time, which means we're going to proceed with the, the second panel. The second panel is comprised of basically two presentations, uh, one of them from a researcher at Wesley University and the other one from the rival KU University. As you know, they are traditional rivals in Japan. I would like to thank our uh, OIS panelists for coming to talk to us today and uh, share their personal experiences with regard to their career path and also research. And uh, thank you also, Jonas, for uh, coming today to talk about opportunities at OIS. Um, let's proceed with the second panel. And if you have any further questions, again, I would like to encourage you to type them in, in the Q&A box. I do have one. It's not a question. Yep. I'm sorry. Go for, I it, just, go for it. I have to go to do some experiments. Is it okay if I will leave the second panel? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. So I would like to ask my. Um, colleague to play the first uh, um, recording because Anke could not be here with us in real time today. Uh, Anke Kennis, a PhD candidate at GSAP's Wasser University on how to study abroad, self-sponsored in Japan at two universities. Okay, so if I could please ask for the video. Hello everyone and welcome to the seminar. My name is Anke Kenes. I am a PhD student at Waseda University. I'm in the doctoral program of political science and I wanted to talk today a little bit about how I ended up in Japan, what sort of journey that I went through, and then also a little bit about my current doctoral research. So Something slightly different uh, about my story and how it began is that my study abroad in Japan is self-financed or was self-financed. So that means that uh, I did all of the research myself. I found scholarships myself for, well, the sole reason being is that I passed all of the deadlines to apply to the Erasmus program. So if I wanted to still go abroad, I had to do it myself. A brief introduction about myself. So my name is Anke. I did my Bachelor of Law at the KU Leuven, that's a Catholic University of Leuven. 
After that, I went to do a Master of International Cooperation Policy at the Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University in Japan. After I graduated from my master's, I worked as a recruitment consultant in Tokyo. And currently I am doing a PhD of political science at Wasa University in Tokyo. And I am living in Kawasaki. So my journey basically started when I found out about APU, uh, APU Ritsumeika, which is located in Beppu, Japan. Uh, here you see photos of the entrance ceremony and then the photo next to it is the photo of the two main buildings of APU and the sunsets were very nice, really lovely. So how did I find APU? Because it really is a small university and the reason why I picked APU is, well, there were various reasons, but mainly because they they had all of the requirements that I was really looking for in my personal situation. So how did I start? Well, I simply Googled. I, it may sound really silly, but that's how I started researching. I, want, I knew I wanted to go abroad after thinking about and also eliminating some countries. I figured that Japan would be the best choice for me because it would allow me to learn a new language. It was a completely different culture from the one in Belgium, where I come from. And it is still a safe country, which is also something that you need to keep in mind if you're going as a woman alone, I think. I researched all of it by myself. I Googled basically Japanese universities offering English courses uh, and also Japanese universities offering scholarships. What I was looking for in particular was a Japanese university that offered courses in English, but also some Japanese language classes on the side. So uh, my menu choice was quite particular in that I knew I wanted to study something related to law and politics, but in English, it had to be in English because I couldn't yet speak any Japanese and I did want to learn Japanese so that's why I also wanted to have a university that offered the language as such but more as a side menu and that's how I found APU because a lot of the universities they either offer only courses in English and then no real Japanese classes unless you you take them separately but then sometimes they they in, they interfere with your other courses so APU allowed for for the master students to have their courses during the day and take Japanese language classes in the evening so it's perfect it was included in the curriculum and also included in the basically in the tuition so that was that was almost perfect for me also, uh, the university offered some tuition reduction if you came from certain areas. And on the website and on the information uh, flyers, they also said that there were multiple scholarships available. And one of the scholarships I was able to get at APU was the Chassel scholarships that maybe some of you may have heard of. Then, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the research that I'm doing. This is my PhD research. This is on the EU's regulatory power through free trade agreements. And I am particularly looking into geographical indications. My research question is whether or not the EU tries to spread its regulations through these free trade agreements. I look into this EU regulatory power through the Brussels effect. So the Brussels effect is a theory that was created by Professor Bradford. Uh, she wrote a really brilliant book and also article about it. So I can highly, highly recommend it uh, if you want to see 
in what kind of ways that the EU's sort of soft power, let's call it, or regulatory power, really seeps through to certain countries where you, where you actually least expect it. So um, I can highly recommend. Uh, it is a bit niche, but very interesting to read. And why do I do the case study on geographical indications? Well, they are a very European, really a, a very European created legal framework. Uh, it originated in France, I think as about a century ago, and nowhere else in the world do they use this system. So that is why when we see GI in, in a free trade agreement or suddenly appearing in a certain country, we know that it has to do something with the EU. Uh, it may be through, through just because that country is bordering on the EU or because EU has created or is negotiating a free trade agreement with that country or for a few other reasons as well. Then, as you can see from the photos, uh, geographical indications have a lot to do with drinks and food. So I, I hope you're not that hungry yet, but uh, I find it really interesting to see how the EU protects its, its certain typical products, such as champagne, such as feta cheese, such as camembert, and so on and how they try to protect it in other countries as well and how to how they try to enforce the system japan as well has started to use the system because of the free trade agreement that it made with the eu my case study is focused on comparing ceta which is the eu and canada free trade, trade agreement and the eu japan economic partnership agreement so i try to compare compare those two when it comes to geographical indications. They have very big differences between themselves and in terms of the scope of geographical indications as well in, in terms of the, the type in, of enforcement of the system. So it's, I, I sort of look at why that is, like why is there, why is there a gap, why is there a difference in the level of protection of these geographical indications? For this research, I use free trade agreement text, of course, that's a given. And I also do a lot of interviews with EU and other officials and also business stakeholders. So it's, I find it, I'm very passionate about it and I really enjoy doing it because you just get to learn so much. You get to speak to very interesting people, very knowledgeable people. And not just for my research, it just, it, it really enriches your life, I find, and you just get such like real-time knowledge. Then I wanted to give you a few examples uh, of what GIs are, and also you, you probably have seen them here and there. So at the bottom of this slide, you can see the red and the green mark. Uh, those are the ones I'm pretty sure most of you have come across them in the supermarket. Uh, next time, if, you, if you're if you out shopping, just have a look at the packaging at the labels and you can probably uh, recognize them. And then next to the red and the blue one, uh, you have the one for Japan. That's one that Japan developed, so Japan geographical indication. So these you see now more and more here in Japan in the supermarkets, you see them pop up more and more. Above here, the the two uh, the text part. These this is basically a screenshot from the EU Japan Economic Partnership Agreement, so from the Free Trade Agreement, and it lists the European geographical indications. Uh, now, since I am from Belgium, I wanted to give um, the Belgian GIs as an example. So, for example, you have Geneva and also Kornbrand. These are typed in the first of all, just the, the the in the language of the country, and then they are also transcripted into Japanese, so the Japanese know how to pronounce it, and also like like 
um, in, in order to cross the language barrier and then which category they are. So these are for Belgium and for Austria. These are the GIs that are protected in Japan now through the EU Japan EPA. Japan started to implement the GI system. Um, it already started it to implement it during the negotiation. So from 2016, it started to implement the system in order for them to make sure that they, they would be ready before the EPA would come into force. The EU GIs are now also protected in Japan and vice versa. So for instance, Japan also has a lot of, you probably heard about Wagyu. Japan wants to protect Wagyu and they have now several kinds of Wagyu in the EU Japan free trade agreement that are now being protected in the EU. That means that um, American producers of Wagyu cannot import their beef under the term Wagyu anymore. So that way it, it really guarantees the European market for Japan for this particular product. Compared with, um, with other FDAs, uh, such as with Canada and South Korea, Japan has been very receptive of this system. They found it to be very, very appropriate to use for their goals, um, especially to protect certain of their products and also their agricultural exports have risen um, also thanks to this system. Then to start wrapping everything up, what I wanted to really be a takeaway from my presentation is that all of this, both the journey to Japan and higher education, as well as the PhD itself, it's not easy, but it is worth it. So I put two photos here. The one on the right uh, is where I was in my Aikido group at APU Ritsumeikan. And it was really fun because we were really a, as you can see, we were a very diverse group. I made some really good friends there. And it was just such a great experience, something that I wouldn't trade for anything. And on the left, uh, that is a photo taken at the EU delegation here in Tokyo. And that's just for me, I wanted to showcase, not brag, of course, but I just wanted to showcase that when like, you, you get, if you really are passionate about your research and depending of course on your topic, but you get to meet really interesting people and you 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 get to go to certain places and events that normally you wouldn't have gone to so this is a really privileged position to be in and i am very very happy and very lucky that i am here today uh, and that i can tell you about all of these experiences that i've had Lastly, I just wanted to leave you with a few useful websites. Um, I am here just shamelessly promoting my own YouTube channel. Um, but if you want to study abroad, especially in Japan, uh, there are a few useful videos on them. I also did an interview with some of the APU alumni and how to apply to APU, which could be interesting. Like these are general lessons, not just for APU, they apply to some apply to any any foreign university uh, also for the japan mix scholarship other scholarships in japan and then also programs at waseda and uh, k Leuven. so thank you so much for your attention if you have any questions my email address is on the first slide so i hope you enjoy the rest of the seminar goodbye Thank you very much, Anka, for the contribution. Uh, again, apologies that Anka couldn't be here with us in real time. Uh, any queries directed to her? Uh, we will definitely relay them to her via email. So please let us know if you have any questions. Our last presenter uh, for today's online session is uh, Peter Todd, and uh, he's a, a researcher at the University of Braunschweig. 
and also at the same time KU University. The collaborative project that he works on uh, is presented with the title A Jumpstart Quantum Computer Collaboration. He's a PhD candidate at the moment uh, with a very promising project. Uh, so I'd like to ask my colleague to uh, again play the presentation. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction. Good uh, afternoon for the people uh, taking part in, in Japan and good morning for uh, the European uh, participants. And uh, uh, thank you very much also for the chance to give a, a short presentation here. I'd like to use this chance to present um, our quantum computer collaboration between the Institute of CMOS Design of the Technical University, University of Braunschweig and the Ishikuro Laboratory of the Keio University. So in today's talk, I'll outline the research presentation and afterwards um, we'll have a deep dive into the actual research content which the participants are doing at their guest institutes. So let's start with Let's start with the collaboration timeline. Um, the first meeting took place in July 2021. That's when uh, I have introduced Professor Ishikuro, who was my previous supervisor during my studies at Keio University, to my current PhD supervisor, Professor Isakov. And shortly afterwards, we figured out that both institutes are very interested in having a international research collaboration. And that's why within one month, we already signed a memorandum of understanding between our laboratories. And uh, in regular meetings, meetings, we have discussed how we would like to shape this collaboration. Putting this to paper, we were able to apply for a DAAD funding in September 2021, which got approved in December the same year. And that's how we could start, could actually jumpstart very quickly, the exchange in 2022 with different activities, which I'm going to outline shortly. Um, a few highlights in August 2022 were the lectures from Professor Isakov at the K University and Professor Ishikuro at the TU Braunschweig, as well as a quantum computer workshop jointly organized from our two institutes and supported by the DWIH. On the bottom side, you can see um, a few pictures showing the highlights of the, showing a few highlights of our collaboration involving the signature of the Memorandum of Understanding, Professor Isakov giving a presentation at the quantum computer workshop and Professor Ishikuro visiting to Braunschweig. On the next slide, I would like to um, outline the activity and given an activity overview of the collaboration. We have structured this into basically four levels involving all possible participants from the institutes, meaning the professor level, PhD researchers and master students. Moreover, we also would like to uh, foster the exchange between academia and industry. And that's why we came up with the scheme of organizing a workshop. So in our first collaboration year, you can see all the activities are marked with the green check, uh, check uh, symbol. So we have already completed these ones. As mentioned before, the lectures from the professors and the quantum computer workshop. Moreover, a Japanese researcher came for six months to a German university. And the German researcher, uh, which is currently me, that's how I could go back to Japan, is visiting the a, a laboratory of Professor um, Ishikuro. And finally, also two master students from Japan got the chance to come to the TU Braunschweig to spend a three month research stay. So for the collaboration in the next year, 2023, we are planning very similar activities. So now that we have seen the structure of the collaboration, what are actually the content of it. So this is based on the quantum related research projects of the cooperation partners itself. So for the Institute of CMOS Design, these are projects which are heavily focusing on ion trap based 
quantum computers, such as ETIC, QMIC, QVLS, which are partially funded by the German government. For the Ishikura lab, on the other hand side, uh, they are involved heavily in the so-called Moonshot Goal 6, in the Moonshot project, particularly the Goal 6, which is uh, focusing on superconducting qubit electrons, uh, computers. And due to this, so even, even, though, even though the quantum computer technologies are different, the circuit design for them remains similar. And that's how we can achieve a great knowledge exchange since the students and the researchers participating in the local projects can learn the design flows of the respective, respective partner institute. On the next slide, I would like to continue with the actual research topics the students and the, and the PhD students are working on. So the motivation for current quantum computer research is mainly scalability. As you can see on the right hand side, it's showing a quantum computer demonstrator built by Google in 2021. The actual quantum computer is sitting in the center of this picture at the golden part. But in order to make this work, huge bulky electronics equipment, which is shown in the back of this picture, uh, is required. So imagine if you want to scale up this computer with a greater number of qubits, you will also need to scale up the electronics for control. And that's simply not possible. So that's why we have to integrate the bulky equipment, the bulky room temperature equipment into the quantum computer. So in order to see a more detailed view, I've prepared um, an animation showing the principle how an ion trap based quantum computer is working. In this animation, you can see that it is containing four phases. The first phase is the loading of ions, which is generated by laser beams and transported on electrode rails to the storage area. From here, the ions are being loaded into the active area of the quantum computer. In the active area, we are using, again, different electronics to produce high frequency signals, which in turn modify the state of the, uh, of the qubit. And with this, a quantum algorithm can be performed. So different ions are entangled with each other to perform the operation. And in the last stage, the ions are going to be read out. So the qubit detection happens again with laser beams. So this animation shows that several signal generators, so several electrical signals generated by components are required to make the system work. And that's where semiconductor can help greatly. And semiconductor design is where the two laboratories participating in this research project can greatly contribute to. Since we are able to manufacture electronic circuits at the same scale as this quantum computer chip. So to put it together with the quantum computer into the cryogenic cooler cooling environment. On the last slide, I would like to show the actual research activities which participating PhD and uh, master students are doing. So starting from the left side, we are first developing a schematic diagram. This is with specific software simulated to validate if the circuits perform as expected. From here, we are using a computer-aided layout drawing program to, out, to manufacture or to draw uh, a plan which then can be manufactured. And at this stage, some iteration is required since each layout is involving parasitic elements which may change the performance of the circuit. So after finishing several of these optimization steps, we can send 
the plan of the chip to a manufacturing company, which is then actually producing the chip and sending it back to us. And that's what we see here on the third picture. This is a silicon photograph of one of these chips. And the size of this is less than one square millimeter. And the last stage is to verify if these chips are actually working as intended. And that's what is shown on the last picture. Here we can see a cryogenic measurement equipment. So since, as I mentioned before, the chip has to work with the with the qubit together at the low temperature, the circuits, of course, have to work at these temperatures. So here in the center of this picture, we can see a silver box. And inside the silver box, a camera is looking from the top. And on the screen, we can see the same chip as shown here in the third picture. And the cables connect this chip to measurement equipment, which then can be used to verify the functionality. So with this, uh, I would like to conclude my presentation today. Uh, at the beginning, I have um, outlined the new research collaboration between the Institute of CMOS Design and the Ishikura Laboratory, and what activities we are planning in our in 20, or what activities we already did in 2022, and what activities we are planning in 2023. And at the end, I have uh, presented to you a short overview about the research content, which actually is done by the participants of this collaboration. So with this, I wish you a um, very nice further research days. And unfortunately, I cannot participate in person today, but uh, feel free to contact me anytime if you have questions. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, Peter, for the great presentation. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the attendees for coming today to view our event. And it's not over yet. The online session for today is over, but the event series itself is just about to start. I would like to ask you to relocate to the German Center for Research and Innovation Tokyo uh, exhibition site. Uh, which is at the German uh, Cultural uh, Center at Akasaka 7555 in Minatoku, Tokyo. The fascination of science special event, uh, which actually was subject to prior registration, is about to start at 6 p.m. this evening, followed by an on-site on reception. We would also like to ask you to be present tomorrow and the day after tomorrow at the ERD day two and three at the same location at the German Cultural Center uh, in Akasaka. And uh, what we have in store for you? Well, uh, tomorrow you will hear the EU ambassador talk about uh, opportunities and uh, encourage uh, researchers to basically contribute to the research community in general. Uh, we will also have uh, science communicators uh, talk about their work. Uh, we'll have uh, career path um, descriptions, uh, career path uh, suggestions. We'll have uh, professionals talk about opportunities. And uh, not only that, but if you would like to participate in a roundtable discussion as an attendee, then we, we would like to welcome you on Friday. And uh, further to that, you will hear from the uh, Finnish Cultural Institute and from the Hungarian ambassador um, in Tokyo to talk about chances and funding opportunities in their countries. So lots will go ahead, uh, lots will go on in the coming days. Please do tune in. And also join us uh, via Twitter, um, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook to follow upcoming events. And please note that tomorrow's session and the day after tomorrow will be streamed on YouTube. Um, so hybrid. At the same time, should you show up tomorrow, 
you can actually land a career path, a personal um, consulting opportunity. Uh, we will basically pick people who come to the venue and they will be presented with this opportunity if you win the lottery, that is. And on the third day, you can still receive personal adv advice, but at the same time, this will be done in the roundtable session and it will be a more general uh, discussion about um, uh, academia industry transfer and how to actually maximize your potential um, through career changes, uh, through further studies, and um, and lots more. Let's just have a look if there are any further questions. No, not at this point. So I would like to thank you for um, your unfailing attention today. Thank you for tuning in. Follow us on SNS. And I'd like to thank my colleagues at the DRD, the DWIH, and uh, also in Kobe and at other locations to have helped with this event today. Thank you and goodbye.